Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Although still very humble, which is amazing, She has been an adventurer and a climber for the past, and today we're going to talk about her story, specifically as it relates to Mount Everest, but also a few other things worked in as well. For those that don't know, 1996 on Mount Everest was an incredibly tragic season that saw the loss of 12 lives, I believe. John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, is based on it, as well as the movie Everest that has come out recently, within the past year or two, I believe. And I actually read Into Thin Air in the ninth grade and have been completely fascinated with Everest ever since. And I never in a million years thought I would get to speak to somebody who has summited Everest, let alone was there on the mountain and in the base camp during that tragic and infamous 1996 climbing season. Because of my extreme fascination with this topic and the fact that Kathy is such an amazingly wonderful storyteller, this episode does go a little bit long, but I think you're going to understand why once you take a listen to Kathy's story and just how all of this adversity has really helped shape her life and how she's not let it stop her from continuing to climb for 20 years after this powerful, powerful time in her life. So I'm not going to waste any more time and I am going to go ahead and jump right on in with Kathy. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for being on the show today. I am so excited to talk to you about your different adventures that you've had. They are absolutely incredible in what you have been able to accomplish. But first, do you mind giving us just a little bit of a background on who you are and what's led to your incredible adventure lifestyle? I'm a South African, born on a huge, incredibly flat grass plain, which is the last place I wanted to spend my life, (laughs) because what it turned out I liked was mountains. Who knows why? I just love being in them. And whether I'm climbing up them or skiing down them or running through them, once I found them, I never turned back. I kind of found them at the age of 18, roughly. I eventually left South Africa when I was about 30 and moved to Europe. I now live in a postage stamp sized country called Andorra in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. So, rock, snow, mountain, sunshine, which is pretty much my perfect lifestyle. And I've been living a mountain climbing expedition focused life for the last 20 years and have every intention of keeping it going as long as I can get out there on two feet. That's fantastic. So you said you've been living this lifestyle for the past 20 years. I guess, you know, year 18, year 19, what did that look like for you before you made that transition? I should say actually year 21, year 22. Well, I didn't even realize I was making the transition at the time. So I first got into the outdoors when I was about 14 on one of these sort of multi-activity summer camp things. Mm -hmm. But at the time, there was just nowhere for a 14-year-old girl to go to get involved in climbing in any form or, or mountaineering. I got to university at 18, discovered the rock climbing club, and I loved it, having been completely useless at school sport and frankly not much of a team player in terms of team sport. I was enchanted with this physical activity that's deeply personal and happens in these wild, remote locations. And I was hooked. I started rock climbing at 18. I started mountaineering at 21. 
but I was still only managing to do occasional expeditions, you know, in my holidays, maybe once a year, particularly given that in South Africa, everything's basically an intercontinental trip to get to do anything anyway. And this was South Africa under sanctions. Well, the tail end of apartheid, so it was complicated to travel. Mm -hmm. So all I knew was that I didn't want to do what my father did. I didn't really know what he did, but he was a business manager, and he put on a suit every morning, and he went to an office, and he did some office things there that just sounded deeply boring. <laughs> and I didn't want to do what my mother did, which was to be a frustrated housewife who didn't have any control over the family money and just felt trapped. So I had to be independent. I had to control my own money, but I deeply didn't want an office job, and I didn't know how else people, you know, paid their own way. Right. So I stuck it out at university collecting higher degrees, kind of as a way of not dealing with the job market, mm -hmm. and was completing my master's in media studies when the first South African Everest expedition was put together. I was not invited to join the team. They had themselves a team of what were considered to be the best climbers in South Africa who were inevitably all male. But at the last minute, a newspaper who was one of the sponsors decided that they didn't think that in the story was kind of, you know, sexy enough, media-worthy mm -hmm. media, media worthy enough. So they'd make it a bit sexier by running a, a kind of pseudo-competition to find a woman to join the team. And this was honestly really early reality television before we even called it reality television yet. But yeah, a... Sunday morning in November, I'm reading the Sunday newspaper, and there it is, splashed over the front page. South Africa's first Everest expedition, and they're looking for a woman to join the team. You can apply. Yes, yeah, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> what was that competition process like? Really strange. <laughs> I don't recommend it as a way of finding people to join a climbing expedition. First of all, I was thoroughly dubious. I mean, I was in my what, I was 26, and this is in the late 1990s. Well, this was 1995. So, you know, people of my, my generation and my education in South Africa were all fairly liberal, politically active, feminist in inclination. And this thing just looked like a complete scam. The men had been invited, and the women were going to have to do some kind of bikini parade in front of the media to get on the team. So some of my friends were just like, no way, we wouldn't touch this. It's, it's quite clearly, you know, deeply sexist. But it also felt like this opportunity. And there were two reasons, neither of which had anything to do with Everest. The one was that I'd wanted for a year or two to get to the Himalaya. I'd already, I'd climbed in Europe and Africa and S South America. And I really wanted to get to the Himalaya, but this was long before there were commercial expeditions or anything like that. So few expeditions went from South Africa. None of them had any woman on them. You couldn't get onto them unless you were already firstly experienced and secondly friends with the people organizing the trips. It just felt like this impossible challenge. Mm -hmm. And the other was that the way this competition was structured they were going to come up with a short list of six women and take them off to climb Kilimanjaro on a kind of selection expedition. And I figured I had a reasonable shot at making that, that list of six. There just weren't that many women with climbing experience in South Africa. And then I'd get a free trip to Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and, you know, where, where's the downside in that? Right. <laughs> so I applied, hoping that I'd get the Kilimanjaro trip. And I did. You had to write a motivation. It was incredibly vague. So you just wrote this motivation. I eventually got told I'd made the shortlist to Kilimanjaro. We left just after Christmas for Tanzania. So six women on the shortlist being judged by a male team leader and being observed by a male film crew of two and a male journalist. Hmm. So really interesting gender mm -hmm. dynamics going on there. <laughs> and... Interesting dynamics among the women as well, because on one hand, we were all terribly sisterly about the whole thing, you know, oh, oh, we're in this together and we'll support each other and we won't go all, you know, mine's bigger than yours, competitive the way that men often do. 
But frankly, that lasted about four days. <laughs> and then it got competitive among the women. <laughs> but we all got to the top of Kilimanjaro. And at the end of that, two of us were actually invited to join the Everest team. Wow. And I was one of them. And that was early January. And we left for Everest in the middle of March. Oh, goodness. That's not a whole lot of time to prepare. No, it's not. <laughs> So what was that preparation time period like for you? Well, on one hand, the minute I put in my application back in middle of November, I started training as if I'd been selected for Everest. Mm. Because I knew the time frame was terribly short. I was also, you know, pretty fit anyway. On the other hand, I didn't go assuming that I was going to climb Everest. I actually don't think it's a terribly good way of approaching any kind of really big project. The way people learned to climb then, and, and still do to some extent now, was a, on a straight apprenticeship system. I think what's changed now is there are a whole lot of sort of commercial qualification type of courses you can go and do. Mm -hmm. But back then, you simply went out there with people who were better than you, and you learned from them, which meant you learned their bad habits along with their experience, but you know, it was very much hands-on. So I went on this Everest expedition, assuming that this is my first Himalayan trip. It just happens to be Everest. And I'm going to big eyes, ask questions, keep my head down, learn everything I can, go as far as I can up the side of this mountain. And at some point, I'll have to stop. And the rest of the team will push on and, and try and get to the summit. And what helps about approaching it like that is I didn't get to base camp feeling incredibly intimidated by the summit. It was just so far away, it wasn't even on my radar. Mm -hmm. I got to base camp intimidated, yes, <laughs> not, not least because there were some terrible team dynamics inside our expedition, but still taking it one day at a time. Oh, and what might be worth pointing out to people listening to this, last year there was a Hollywood movie called Everest. Mm -hmm. True story. This is that season. Wow. I was on a team that was on Everest during the events that they made that movie. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what that would have been like. Well, we didn't know yet because, of course, the movie is about this enormous storm that happens halfway through the season. Mm -hmm. But yes, if anybody does remember, in the movie, there's a terribly short piece where they mock a little team from South Africa for not knowing how to put crampons on. Mm -hmm. That was our team. Oh, goodness. What, what, what they show in the movie isn't particularly accurate. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was on the little team from South Africa where all the big expeditions from America and Europe were laughing at our lack of experience. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes, because this was the first South African Everest team, correct? Exactly. Wow. Yeah, so we didn't exactly come to the Himalaya with, you know, a... a, a a star-studded CV <laughs> of climbing experience. Oh, goodness. And so other than occasionally receiving a little bit of, you know, mockery, how did that translate when you were actually out there? It was okay. I'm going to skip past all our terrible team dynamics because we solved most of that by the time we got to base camp. Three people on the team walked out. Oh, goodness. But frankly, the rest of us got on a good deal better once they were gone. So that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. On the mountain itself... Very much a stage at a time. We knew we weren't that experienced, so we didn't come in there with big aspirations. We just tried to work our way up from one camp to the next to the next. And the result was that we reached Camp 4, 8,000 meters, the top camp, just before that storm hit. Mm. And there were four teams at the top camp deciding what to do ourselves, the Taiwanese, Rob Hall's commercial expedition and Scott Fisher's commercial expedition. And we were the team that decided not to go because we felt that the weather was too unstable given our level of experience. Mm -hmm. It was a terribly hard decision because we're watching Rob Hall and Scott Fisher and the Taiwanese choose to go. And we know they're more experienced than we are. And you're tempted to think, well, I'll just, you know, like follow along behind <laughs> the guys. Like, no, 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 you know, we, we've made our own choices. We've agreed we're not going to climb onto what we called unknown ground, where we hadn't been before, in unstable weather. 
we are going to stay put and wait for the weather to improve. And yeah, good thing we did. Because those teams got to the summit, but they didn't get down, or not all of them, because a storm came in the following evening. And we were then trapped in that storm at 8,000 meters for another two nights, and then joined everybody in having to retreat all the way back to base camp. Wow. And so, I mean, for those two nights, what was going through your head? Because whether you're continuing up the mountain in that storm or you're staying put, either one is, is harrowing and has to be just, you know, terrifying. It's particularly odd because it's a strange combination of terrifying and boring. Mm -hmm. Because it's actually quite hard to be thoroughly scared hour after hour when nothing's mm -hmm. happening. You know, inside the tent, you're sheltered from the wind, which is probably the most important thing. You've got very good sleeping bags, good clothing. We've got stoves. So we're fully dressed because we're afraid that the tents are going to tear in the storm. Right. And you can't be thrown out into the storm in your socks and your underwear. So we, we aren't sleeping. We are sitting fully dressed, huddled up in our sleeping bags, trying to get any information across the radios. But there's, there's so little communication possible in the storm. On the one hand, we're kind of keyed up for something to go really wrong. And we know in tiny little drips of information, eventually, that other teams are possibly in trouble. But there's so little coherent information coming through that we don't know what's going on, not really. But on the other hand, you're just sitting there, you know, and it's literally hours between little scraps of radio calls and the tents are holding and it's really boring. Right. It's very odd being on the seesaw between fear and just like going, oh, for, you know, for Christ's sake. Can't something happen? Can't the storm die? Can't there be a resolution? Can't we just like hurry up this particular movie? Because this is getting really, really repetitive. Right. Yeah, that was odd. Yeah, I, that makes sense for it to be. It's almost as if you don't know what to feel. I mean, you just get, you know, frustrated that it just won't end. Exactly. Yeah. So once the storm did break, what happened after that? Well, Everybody retreated back to base camp, mm -hmm. and a lot of teams gave up at that point. Clearly, anybody who was directly caught in the storm, uh, that's the sensible thing to do. There were people who had been injured, there were people who'd been killed, but there were quite a lot of teams on the mountain. I think there were 13 teams, but I couldn't swear to whether it was 12 or 13, and Teams who hadn't been caught in the storm in any direct sense were also giving up. And we had an interesting choice, which is what do you do? Because in one sense, climbing is risky. So you aren't going to stop climbing because people got killed on a mountain. On the other hand, it's not normally this in your face. Mm -hmm. The danger, the risk, the consequences of the risk. On the other hand, a little team from South Africa... There's almost no chance, well, at, at that point, I thought, there's almost no chance we'll ever get another opportunity to do this. It does feel like once in a lifetime. And then there's the funny result that we, I mean, we didn't do anything particularly brave or important or heroic in the storm. But we also didn't make many mistakes. We'd been careful and cautious mm -hmm. and sensible. We hadn't panicked. We'd kept our heads during the storm. There was a certain way in which, having got back down to base camp, we're kind of looking at each other and thinking, hmm, if we went back up there with good conditions, with good weather, we could do this. So where people ex expected us to be terrified by the storm and, you know, ready to give up, we weren't. In a lot of ways, we were more confident not wanting to be in a storm again, but more confident about getting up there in good conditions and doing what needs to be done to finish the climb. Right. But of course, that wasn't terribly well received by, you know, family and media back in South Africa. <laughs> right. <laughs> because of course the media have blown the... You know, this was the first time that a big disaster on a Himalayan mountain happened in real time with media. I mean, it's hard to, th to imagine now but these were some of the very first teams ever to run websites from base camp. 
it's one of the very first times that a number of teams were on Everest with satellite telephones. It was the first time the media had been able to report live as a disaster unfolded. So the world is kind of enthralled, shocked, fascinated. Yeah, we are a car crash and the rest of the world is rubbernecking the accident in a sense for the very first time. Nowadays with social media, we're used to this. But 20 years ago, it was really quite the event. So we want to go back. The media does not think it's a good idea at home. <laughs> Our families aren't at all sure it sounds like a good idea. We go back onto the mountain, and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot more to the story about that decision. Mm -hmm. And halfway up the mountain, we get a phone call from South Africa, and it's Nelson Mandela, who at that point was the president of South Africa. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> we, di we didn't believe it. They called us on, on the radio at Camp 2, you know, from base camp, they call us, and they're like, ah, oh, President Mandela just phoned, he's on the line, you know, he wants to talk to you. It's like, yeah, no, you know, come off, <laughs> come off it, guys, you're kidding. It's like, no, it's Nelson Mandela. And he spoke to us, the phone call was being transmitted live on radio in South Africa. And what he basically said was, I'm proud of you, and I'm proud of you for trying again. I believe that you can do this. Now, of course, he didn't have the faintest idea whether we could do it. Right. You know, he's a, he's a politician, he's an activist, he's a statesman. He knows nothing about mountain climbing. But the fact remains that that vote of confidence and, and kind of done publicly, it's like, oh my God, now we really do have to do it. <laughs> you have no choice now. <laughs> yeah, kind of. But also, where we'd been sort of second-guessing our choice, because we were doing this, you know, after the storm and with all this massive negative media coverage and so on. It's like, yeah, okay, we're in. We're going climbing. And we did. I mean, we were still careful. We blew one possible summer chance. We backed off and another team got to the top. So that when we fin finally went for the summit, we were the last team on Everest. We'd been on the mountain base camp at above for nine weeks, which is ridiculously long time. Mm -hmm. for uh, this kind of expedition. And yeah, 29th of May, 10 o'clock in the morning, we stood on the summit of Everest. That's incredible. What was that moment like for you? Do you re even remember what was going through your mind? Oddly enough, the summit itself wasn't the best moment because mountain climbing is not like marathon running. You don't sort of cross the finish line and get to crumble onto the tarmac and then mm -hmm. call a taxi. Mountain climbing, you've got to get down again. And so many accidents happen to climbers on the way down because they're very tired and they're unfocused. So as soon as I hit the summit, I was worrying about the descent. The best moment, so the context for this, you can't see the summit of Everest from base camp and you can't see it for most of the climb. All you can see is something called the South Summit, which is a subsidiary. And between the south summit and the main summit is a famous knife-edge rock ridge, which has about a 10,000-foot drop on either side. And in the middle of that ridge, sorry, I think I said rock ridge, it's a snow ridge. It's a knife-edge snow ridge. And in the middle of that snow ridge is a rock climb called the Hillary Step, which is the last technical obstacle before the summit. And it's very famous. And you can't see it. So people spend an enormous amount of time speculating about the Hillary step and how difficult it's going to be and whether we're good enough and what's your strategy and you know, all sorts of nonsense. And then about eight o'clock in the morning, I stagger up onto the top of the South Summit. And for the very first time, I get to see that knife edge snow ridge with these huge drops on either side and the Hillary step. And I just looked at it and I thought, I can climb that. It's not that hard. And that moment was the first time I ever thought, I believe, I really believe I'm going to get to the top of Everest. And then it was another two hours making my way along that ridge before we finally, finally got to the top. But that moment at eight o'clock in the morning, looking at the ridge and going, yes, I'm going to do this. That was the best moment. That's amazing. Like, I mean, obviously, I don't understand, you know, what you're going through, why that was the best moment. But believing in yourself and knowing that you can do something that, I mean, so few people in this world are capable of doing, that does have to be a powerful feeling. 
I think it's that culmination of so much planning and working and hoping and failing and backing off and trying again. I'm not a person who goes through life claiming that, you know, if you dream it, you can do it and you only have to believe in yourself and everything's <laughs> possible. It's not. It's just not true. Most of us don't have the absolute physical and mental talent for some of the hardest things in the world. And then a lot of us simply don't have the kind of opportunity required for a bunch of things. We have to work. You know, we work and try and scheme and learn and fail and try again. And then every so often in life, there's a moment when you go like, yes, all this work, and it's actually going to come together for me at this moment on this day. But I don't think it actually happens that often in life with pure clarity, the way it does to be standing looking at the summit of Everest and going, yes, that one's mine, and I'm going to be there in a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. And so making your way back down the mountain after summiting and especially getting back to base camp, having accomplished this after the, you know, the terrible season that so many people had experienced, what was that like for you? Well, the trouble is that clearly what one would have hoped it was like was this amazing finish to the expedition and celebration of success and enormous pride in all we'd done and the first South African ascent. But a member of our team was killed on the way down. Oh, goodness. So six to the summit and only five come down. And that's a long story about what happened. And to some extent, we don't fully know what happened. But it was a brutal experience. Because within about 12 hours, I went from this amazing success, both personally and for the team and for South Africa, to this terrible tragedy. Because we do, we do live a contradiction when we do high-risk sport. We do know that we're doing things that might get someone killed while believing that we will be sufficiently careful, cautious, experienced, you know, prudent, that it won't happen to us. Right. So nobody goes to Everest saying, yes, one of our team will die and we don't care. The summit of Everest is worth it. It isn't. If you knew one of your team was going to get killed, you wouldn't go. We go believing that we will make the right choices that mean it doesn't happen to us. And mostly we do. I mean, I've done a hell of a lot of climbing in my life and had no serious injuries and no serious accidents. But on the other hand, I've lost friends. I've lost friends to various kinds of, of climbing accidents. It doesn't have to be Everest. I don't have an answer to the conundrum of, of how we can think it's worth it and yet be devastated when it happens. But it is devastating. And losing Bruce was devastating. And so we didn't come back to the base camp with this wonderful success. We came back with this loss and this failure and this tragedy. And we walked into a hornet's nest of media coverage as to what had gone wrong and why. And we didn't know what had gone wrong. Basically, he disappeared and didn't come back. So we didn't have an answer, which made it look as if we were just hiding the truth. When we weren't, we didn't know what to say. And, you know, this was just a, a little team. We, we might have been the first South African Everest expedition, but it wasn't as if we had government support or, you know, the kind of backup that national sports teams have. We didn't have PR people. We didn't have media training. We, we didn't know what to say or what to do. The whole thing was incredibly traumatic and very, very confusing. Again, do I feel proud of myself? Do I just feel traumatized? Should be, I be ashamed personally of what happened? Am I guilty for it? Am I still allowed to be sort of quietly pleased with what happened and yet in the middle of this? It, uh, yeah. Really, really difficult. And so how how do you, I guess, come back from that and let it not stop you? Because obviously you didn't stop climbing and, I mean, you even went back to Everest again. So how do you not let something like that just let you completely shut down? I think there are a couple of different levels in which you need to think about what that experience means. So one level is about levels of risk and what you consider an acceptable risk for a sport or an activity that you love. And you shouldn't be working that out on Everest. 
you need to have thought that through much earlier in your climbing career. <laughs> and in my case, I'd already lost a very close friend, an ex-boyfriend, on a mountain in Peru. I wasn't on the expedition when he was killed. We'd broken up amicably. Life was taking us in different directions about six months before it happened. So we were still close, and he was climbing with a friend of ours, someone else I knew reasonably well, and they were both killed on the west face of Salcante. Mm. That was my time of sitting down and going, like, what does it really mean to do sport that might get you killed? And it was kind of the first time that I had to deal with, you know, actually sitting there watching what it does to the family of the people who don't come back. Because the thing about being young is you're going like, it's my life. Mm -hmm. It's my life and I'll do what I want. I'm finally an adult. Oh, thank God. You can see that I wasn't that keen on being a kid. <laughs> I loved being an adult. I'm an adult and I can live my life the way I want to. And then as you get a little bit older and you start seeing young adults who've been killed in car crashes or, you know, killed doing sport or whatever, and you see the damage it does to their families, and you start thinking, yeah, it's my life, but I'm part of a network. I have obligations and I have kind of responsibilities that are about more than just me. So Stephen's death was kind of the time to think through a lot of that and what it means. My conclusion, I guess, was that, you know, part of what made Stephen such an engaging, interesting, lovely young man to know was his enthusiasm for life, his passion for challenge, his desire to take on wild adventures and see if he could do them. And you sort of couldn't have Stephen without having the level of risk he was prepared to take. And so I decided, yes, I'd go on climbing. I'd, I'd try and do it carefully. And I'd accept that a certain level of potentially life-threatening risk was going to run through those choices. And it has in 20 years. I've, I've never kind of made it as a world-class climber, partly because I don't think I'm talented enough, but partly because I'm too cautious. And I did do an expedition in 2012, which is the hardest thing I've ever done in the Himalaya. I was part of a team that tried to climb a new route on Nanga Parbat, which is the ninth highest mountain in the world. And the route was called the Mazeno Ridge. And we were climbing it alpine style, which is much more difficult and more committing. And a team of six, four of us, got as far as making the first summit bid and then decided that the whole thing had just got way too dangerous. And we went down. And the other two tried again. They got to the top. They nearly killed themselves. Rick lost some of the tips of his toes to amputation because of frostbite. I think they did the last five days of the climb with no food and no tent, and the last three days with no water. Wow. I mean, this was... I mean, they won a Pialet d'Or, which is a kind of the equivalent of winning an Oscar in the mountaineering community. <laughs> it was a stunning achievement. And they same, came so close to killing themselves. And... I'm really glad that I went down <laughs> right. because I don't think I've got what it takes to do, do what they did. So, God, that's an incredibly long-winded way of telling you <laughs> that one thing you've got to take away from, from risk choices is what's my personal limit? And you need to think that through for yourself. You need to think that through in terms of how you feel about your parents and your siblings and the person you marry and the children that you have. How much of it is your life and how much of it you need to keep other people in mind. But then the other thing that came out of that experience was this was an incredibly public failure, kind of. I mean, our expedition was already, as I said, a, a soap opera because of all the team infighting that had happened early on. And then there was the enormous storm and the, and the worldwide press coverage. And then we get to the top, and then somebody gets killed on the way down. So the media storm we walked into was, was gigantic. And it, it was in many ways an enormous failure to get somebody killed on the mountain. And I was such a middle-class girl, very invested in pleasing my parents and pleasing my teachers and, you know, not failing at things, making safe choices. I was academically good, and I made quite sure I only did subjects I was never going to fail in and I excelled at everything and, you know, very invested in not being, well, not, yeah, not failing. And here I was in the middle of this countrywide failure that had played out on television and on national newspapers. And 
came back to South Africa and there were all these strangers who had opinions about me and what I'd done and what I should have done. And it was really strange. And again, this was 20 years ago. It was a time when we, everyone was a lot more private about their lives. Right. So it was an enormous shock to just have strangers on the street recognize me and then have opinions. But it was really good for me. In a, in a strange way, because on one hand, all this publicity opened opportunities that then led to the lifestyle I've led for the next 20 years. You know, I never, I never had a job. I've never had a job, not a real one. I finished my master's. Uh, I'd already submitted, so all I had to do was the corrections. And I was done. I was on a self-employed adventure lifestyle ever since. So it opened up huge opportunities, but it also made me a lot more confident about having the courage to go out there on my own. And the confidence didn't just come from, oh yeah, well you've climbed Everest, you ought to be confident. It actually, a lot of it came from having waded through the mess of this massive media controversy and surviving it and realizing that failing at things, it's not fun. It hurts and you end up lying in bed with a pillow over your head crying because of some of the things that are being said about you publicly. And you spend a lot of time trying to justify yourselves to people and realizing that they don't get it. Right. And, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which it's not fun. But I was a lot braver about trying things that might fail because I'd already slogged through that experience and realized it's okay. You can come out on the other side. You can find opportunity in the mess. You can do your best to steer the experience in ways that are going to lead you to a life that, that's really fulfilling. Right. And you did come out of the other side. You, I mean, not only have you had this adventure lifestyle for 20 years, but you even went back to Everest and you set a record. Is that correct? Yes. That's kind of strange because it wasn't that I was particularly invested in Everest. I've never been that invested in Everest, which is really weird given that Everest is the foundation of my entire adventure career. I teamed up with the expedition leader from that first project. And we realized that given everything that had happened, we were in a fairly good position to try and raise sponsorship to do some other expeditions. And what we actually wanted to do was K2, which is the mm -hmm. second highest mountain in the world. But we figured we didn't really have enough experience. K2 is a whole level more mm -hmm. difficult than Everest. So we wanted to do another one of the really big mountains, you know, the Makalu or Kachinyunga or, or, or something like that. And we couldn't raise sponsorship. I mean, this was South Africa. And they've got, there's no mountain background. They've basically heard of Everest, Kilimanjaro, and Table Mountain. You know, that's it. We just couldn't raise money for some, you know, difficult to pronounce mountain in the Himalaya. But people kept saying, but Everest, you know, oh, we'd be interested in sponsoring Everest. And like, we've done Everest. What's the point? But eventually we sat down and said, this is ridiculous. But the truth is, we want one of the really high mountains of the world that we feel is, will kind of stretch us, but is possible in preparation for K2. And the sponsors want Everest. How do we make this work? And I think this is really important for anybody who's trying to think about how are they going to fund adventure. You've got, what are they, the, the Venn diagram, the two circles. Mm -hmm. What you want to do, what the sponsors want to pay for, and what the media wants to cover. Three circles. And you're looking for the place those three circles overlap. So yeah, the media were up for Everest. The sponsors wanted Everest. How do we make that work for ourselves? Well, you go to the other side. It's a different country. So for us, it's an expedition to Tibet. It's a different kind of climbing. The geology is very different. The weather's different. The only place the two routes meet is literally on the summit. You can't see onto the other side until you climb right onto the top. So for us, it's exactly like being on a completely new mountain. Right. And for the sponsors, it's the big E, the magic E word. <laughs> so we went back to Everest. So what record was it that you set when you did that? It wasn't that simple. <laughs> I was kind of aware that at this point, no woman in the world had climbed Everest from both the south and north sides. But I was also well aware that there's almost no way to say that Everest is like 100% certain. 
Mm -hmm. So I at no point publicly said I was after the record. And I didn't set it up privately either. I was kind of aware that it was out there, but I've always believed in you climb your mountain day by day, camp by camp. You don't want to be making choices that are influenced by the fact that you're chasing some record. If the weather's bad, the weather's bad. And, you know, you need to make that judgment based on the weather, not mm -hmm. based on some record that you're, you're racing for or something like that. And we failed. That expedition, we didn't get to the top. On our summer day, we came across a woman. Uh, she was American. She was trying to be the first American to climb Everest without oxygen, and she'd succeeded. But incredibly briefly, there were only two of them, herself and her Russian husband. No oxygen, no Sherpa support, no team, no radios. Which is, if you get it right, it makes you world class. And if you get it wrong, it makes you dead. And they got to the top, but they took way too long to get to the top. She collapsed on the way down. He left her to go for help. He fell off the mountain and disappeared. His body was found years later. And we found her after she'd been up there for something like 48 hours already with a couple of hours left of life, which was just not enough for us to rescue her. Mm -hmm. So we abandoned the expedition in the face of this. I mean, I just couldn't. After realizing there was nothing we could do that was going to save her life, I couldn't just step over her and keep climbing. <laughs> you know, that's, just, that's not why I climb. Despite all the difficulty, I climbed for the joy of it. And, you know, there, there was no joy in this moment. So, so we backed off. And we went back a year later. So I got to the top a second time, three years after the first climb. And the record was still there. So there I was, the first woman in the world to have climbed Everest from both south and north sides. And it's a funny record. And I still feel slightly odd about it. 20 years later, because in climbing terms, it's really not very significant. It was more an act of just good timing that I happened to be the woman who did that. You know, the two routes I climbed are the two classic routes on Everest. Yes, they're difficult, but they're not, they're not the hardest in the Himalaya. They're not, they weren't new routes. They weren't cutting-edge expeditions. They were done with oxygen and Sherpa support, you know. I'm not going to walk into an international gathering of climbers and start going like, oh, do you know who I am? You know, it's like, yeah, no. It's not that kind of record. But it's been incredibly useful in terms of funding what I've done since. So I use it and I put it on my website and I put it on my business cards and, you know, and I feel slightly funny about it. I always have. <laughs> Well, I mean, whether it's quite as impressive to, you know, experienced or expert climbers, it's still something that, I mean, you were the first woman, you know, no one before you had done it. And it's something that most people, male or female in this world, will never, ever experience. So it's still incredible. Well, it's been incredibly good to me. Right. Everest, for all I sometimes get a little bit tired of being mm -hmm. the Everest woman, you know, even 20 years after I did the climbs, it's been incredibly good to me and, you know, has, has opened such a range of opportunity of, of other things that are exciting to me, even if they're not as sort of exciting to people who know less about climbing or about right. adventure. Right. Even if they're not quite as flashy or, or well known. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so you've written about your adventures, is that correct? Yes. There was one more expedition to Everest, God help me. And we weren't trying to go to Everest. We were trying to go to the North Pole. And it's not that we sort of got lost. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly, our major sponsor for the North Pole trip got taken over. It was a hostile takeover. And we didn't actually have our hands on the check yet. Mm. The sponsorship money. Believe me, it's not sponsorship until you actually have the money in your bank account. So they got taken over. The marketing budgets all got pulled. All, all agreements were basically voided by the new, the new owners. And it's like, oh, God, our sponsorship money just vanished. But we had some money from other sponsors, and we'd done the training, and we'd taken the time out. So it's like, what kind of expedition can we put together at really short notice that won't cost as much? 
and that might be interesting enough that we'll keep our media sponsors and our, you know, our other sponsors on board. And we thought, well, east face of Everest. There are at least two routes on Everest that have never been climbed. And we weren't realistically a strong enough team to actually do a first ascent. But we pivoted the trip and said, we'll, we'll go to the east face of Everest as a reconnaissance and look at these new routes and see whether there's realistically a chance that we could come back with a stronger team and do them. So the fourth expedition was to try and do a new route on the east face of Everest. It was the 50th anniversary of the first ascent that year. And frankly, we got to the bottom, had a look at the new routes and went like, oh, holy shit, yeah, no, that's not happening. <laughs> And they still haven't been done, either of them. Wow. So, no, adventure adventure is not dead, even on Everest. You don't have to join the queue of commercial clients, you know, that we get these days. The east face of Everest is waiting for anybody who's really got the balls to get out there and try it. <laughs> right. So the book, the book is about the four expeditions to Everest, these four different stories. And I called it just for the love of it, because I was so sick of men writing books called things like killer mountain and the death zone and you're like oh my god macho macho conquering stuff mm -hmm. i wanted to write a book that was much more emotionally honest about you know what it actually feels like to be stuck halfway up that mountain and also something that shared the fact that in the end despite the difficulty i do this for the joy of it the love of it yeah i really do get an enormous amount out of being in these environments and trying these challenges and, and I wanted to share more of that side of it. So, yes, the book is called Just for the Love of It, and you will find it on Amazon. Okay, perfect. And I will absolutely put a link to that in the show notes for this episode as well. And so one final question here for, for this part. For anyone who is kind of maybe in the situation you were, maybe they're in university and they just keep putting off having to face the real world and face a real job or Maybe they're already even in that corporate world, but they just feel something missing. They're tired of living their life on repeat. They want more adventure, but, you know, maybe they're not quite so experienced or they just don't know where to start. What do you recommend to them to help them start getting a little bit more adventure into their life? My two top tips. The one is don't think of it as all or nothing. That if you can't do the Everest expedition or the year off to hitchhike around the world, or walking across Africa, you can't do it. Yes, I mean, I got onto Everest in this slightly bizarre manner. But the fact remains, I'd been climbing at that point for eight years. I'd self-funded little expeditions to Central Africa and South America. I took a year off to try and get to Europe and work to, for the money for that. I'd been quietly accumulating small adventures, skills, experience, contacts, so that when the Everest came blazing into my life, I had the experience and the confidence to make a play for a place on that team. So don't think of it as all or nothing. What are you doing this weekend that's actually adventurous and will help you get one step further in terms of skills and contacts and experience towards what you think of as your bigger adventure goal? And that sh shades into the second thing, which is build skill. We make these things work because we have a, a, an array of tools that we're carrying in our rucksacks in a metaphorical sense. So whatever it is that you want to do, there's a bunch of things you're going to need to know. Whether it's you're, you're a climber and you're going to need to know about rope work and, and safety procedures, whether it's about remote traveling and you should know some stuff about navigation and map reading and communications, whether it's about trying to get sponsors eventually and you need to know something about storytelling, writing stories, writing articles, taking photographs, shooting video. If you can get out this weekend and learn something about hiking or packing a rucksack or shooting a video, or telling a little story and crafting it into a tiny piece on social media that three other people like, you've learned something. And then next weekend, you can make it slightly ambitious. And you've got your three weeks of leave. Oh, God, you're, you guys are Americans. <laughs> um, so sorry. You've got your 10 days of leave. If you're lucky, you move to Europe. Six <laughs> weeks of leave is so much better. But whatever it is, that, that little bit of thing, have a 10-day adventure if 10 days is what you've got. Have a 10-day adventure and make yourself a 10-day 
little video of it using your phone and put it out on a little bit of social media that you've set up beforehand and try and write an article about it and find one blog who will post your article because, hey, that sounded cool. Because then you're that much closer. When the opportunity finally comes, or you've got the money you need, or you meet the person, or you come across the, the media outlet or the sponsor, you can walk into that opportunity with confidence and skill and experience already. And that wraps up part one of my interview with Kathy O'Dowd. And I hope that now you understand why this episode was nearly twice as long as my part ones usually are. I just got so wrapped up in not only Kathy's story, but her ability to tell the story. She's such a wonderful storyteller. And getting to hear her experiences on Everest and just taking Everest aside, just her incredible life experiences period, was very powerful for me. Now, I will have links to Kathy's book and her social media accounts and her website in the show notes for this episode, and you can find those at livinguncoventionally.com forward slash episode 118. And as usual, those are the actual numbers, 118. Another treat is that Kathy is in the Living Unconventionally Facebook community. So if you're not in there already, you're going to want to join. Kathy has already been active in the group and is possibly even meeting up with a fellow unconventionalist community member this winter to go skiing. So those relationships are being formed and it's wonderful to see that being fostered. And Kathy actually asked me if she would be able to utilize the group to do some research for an upcoming project on how to fund an adventure lifestyle. So you're going to want to be in there to be a part of that for her. And I'm sure that she would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. All you have to do to join that community is click the link that will also be in the show notes I just mentioned, or just simply go to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. I want to invite you to come back on Wednesday for part two of my interview with Kathy. Obviously, her adventures do come up a little bit more, but she takes the approach of explaining how she was able to have an adventure lifestyle for the past 20 years and be able to say that she has never had a real job. She's going to talk about sponsorships and grants and just ways that you can incorporate more adventure into your life right now. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I cannot wait to have you back on Wednesday. Wednesday.